Between the time when the stars were at war and the rise of the sons of Cybertron, there was an age undreamed of when savage toy lines spread across the world like plastic armies destined to meet in battle beneath the skies. A time now known as the early 1980s. This strange and foreign world had a fantasy aesthetic all its own, smelted in the furnace of artists such as Frank Frazetta, Boris Vallejo, and Earl Norham. It was forged on the anvil of comics by many master smiths, including John Bushima, Mike Grail, Barry Smith, and the great Jack Kirby. The style was further honed by other artists too numerous to count in these annals. It was quenched in the waters of 1980s arcade, computer, and console video games. It was then given strong arms to wield it in the films of 1980s cinema and it was sent out among the hordes brushed into the sides of powerful mounts. And finally it was tested in battle during Saturday morning and after school cartoons. And unto this came He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe destined to trample other toy lines under his leathered boots and inspire countless other fantasy toy lines set in worlds where savagery, super science, and sorcery converge. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. In the late 1970s, due to many factors, including the release of the phenomenally popular Star Wars film in 1978, its extremely popular associated toy line produced by Kenner, the rise in popularity of fantasy role-playing games such as Dungeons and Dragons, and the introduction of fantasy-themed adventure comics such as Conan the Barbarian, the 1980s dawned with fantasy adventure-themed products primed to explode. So in early 1982, the Mattel Toy Company released the Masters of the Universe toy line. The action figures were created on a base 5.5 inch scale and featured heavily muscled bodies and a mix of medieval and science fiction weapons and armor. The first wave of figures included eight different characters. The main character of the toy line was He-Man, deemed the most powerful man in the universe who wielded fantastic weapons and armor and rode a giant green armored tiger into battle. He had access to high-tech war vehicles seemingly left over from a different age. The themes found in this toy line would greatly influence the toy industry. The character was originally going to have different sets of armor and weapons that could change his powers, but Mattel decided to instead offer different versions of the character, each with different outfits, weapons, and associated powers. The line was extremely popular, but the He-Man offered at the beginning of the toy line was very different in more than just looks and accessories to the character that existed when the line fell out of popularity. And while there have been many videos dedicated to the origins of the Masters of the Universe toy line, I want to briefly focus on He-Man's barbarian origins in terms of art and design, the original art of the Masters of the Universe toy line. It was this original look that would inspire many other knockoff and supplemental toy lines throughout the early 1980s. The original Masters of the Universe aesthetic was set in many kids' minds, with the first four mini-books offered as pack-ins and included with the action figures of the first wave. These books depicted a very different He-Man to the hero he would develop into, and a much more savage world than the Eternia given to us in the Filmation cartoon. This He-Man took obvious inspiration from the barbarian warrior and savage fantasy movement that was popular in the late 1970s, and the original booklets borrowed a lot of their style from the savage fantasy comics, including the comics based on Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian character that were very popular during this time. This original He-Man did not have an alter ego, and he certainly felt less like a sword and sorcery Superman or an early Marvel Comics Thor and more like the barbarian heroes that were prowling through comics, films, and cartoons of the time. 
Adding to this feel was the box art that was included on the original vehicles and playsets offered during the first wave of the toys in the early days of the product. The original box art on the famous Castle Grayskull depicted a much more dark and foreboding place, more akin to the aesthetic of a haunted attraction found at an amusement park at the time. It was a place that seemed to harbor as much danger as it did the promise of great power and mystery. The box art was clearly inspired, and some would say by deliberate design, to Frank Frazetta's barbarian fantasy artwork. This artwork could depict many different subjects and characters, but often featured Howard's Conan the Barbarian. This aesthetic was the primary style that would influence the myriad of sword and sorcery toy lines that would be offered during this time. The toy line expanded greatly over the next few years, and eventually would include multiple playsets, vehicles, and a large and diverse range of characters. The product line is considered one of the great cultural elements of the 1980s, and such success spawned many imitators and knockoffs, as well as an entire industry based on creating toys that could supplement and be played with the ever-expanding Masters of the Universe toy line. These imitators and supplemental toy lines came in a wide spectrum of quality. Some were considered nearly as good as the Progenitor toy line, while others are thought of as crimes against humanity. We will start with one of the better imitators, in this case the toy line called Blackstar, by the toy company Galoob. The Blackstar toy line was actually based on a filmation cartoon that predated the Masters of the Universe toy line. The cartoon was initially not very successful, but the popularity of the Masters of the Universe convinced filmation to re-release the cartoon along with this new toy line. Blackstar was very similar to the Masters of the Universe, and featured a muscle-bound, magic sword-wielding character named John Blackstar, who was an Earthman who found himself on another world, with great powers and thrown into the events afflicting this alien land. The articulated figures also came with a small PVC diminutive figure of either a good trobit or an evil goblin. I'm going on an adventure! The toy line was relatively well made and generally successful, with several waves of figures, vehicles, and playset releases. They were made to be generally in scale with the Masters of the Universe line, and the figures themselves were eventually upgraded to include a gimmick called a Laser Lights, in which a mechanism that created a spark was added to the backs of each of the figures, and it could be viewed through opaque panels on the figures' chests. While He-Man seemed to take a lot of its aesthetic style from Conan and the other Barbarian offerings at the time, Blackstar's design seems to have borrowed heavily from Edgar Rice Burroughs' character, John Carter of Mars. The character of Blackstar bears a striking resemblance to John Carter in more than just looks. Like Blackstar, John Carter was a man from Earth who found himself on another world given extraordinary powers and embroiled in the conflict that engulfed that distant land. In addition, this world mixed advanced and strange science fiction with savage fantasy. Blackstar may have been a line that was created to make money off the barbaric fantasy fad of the 1980s, but it was a solid toy line in and of itself. The groundbreaking action figure line featuring the hero called Sunman first hit toy store shelves in 1985. It was produced by a company called Olmec Toys and has a unique background story. Sun Man gained his powers from the sun and was one of the few black action figures available among the sword and sorcery inspired toy lines at that time. Sun Man was created by Illa Eason who wanted a diverse action figure sandbox for kids of all backgrounds to play in. She explained that it was her conscious decision to make Sun Man fit into play with Mattel's Masters of the Universe. She wanted a child to be able to open up the package, put him on the ground with all the other Masters of the Universe characters, and fit right in. Sun Man was part of a diverse toy line called the Rulers of the Sun that included a Latino tech expert named Digitino, a telekinetic ninja named Space Sumo, and a Native American who tossed lightning bolts named Boltman. The figures were well made and designed and were considered a cultural success. Another one of the more successful and relatively well made and popular supplemental toy lines was Remco's The Lost World of the Warlord. The Lost World of the Warlord was a comic title published by DC that was contemporaneous with the Conan the Barbarian and Cole the Destroyer comics published by Marvel. It borrowed heavily from Edgar Rice Burroughs' The Lost World novels. 
The figures of the Warlord toy line were constructed very similar to the Masters of the Universe figures, and some have argued that, in some cases, the quality could be slightly higher than that of the early He-Man toy line. In fact, Remco would be taken to court by Mattel in an attempt to get them to cease production on the line, but Mattel would ultimately lose, and it was decided that no company could own a body style, and in this case, muscled action men in a crouching pose. This certainly opened the doors for many more imitators. The line was made up of sword and sorcery type characters from DC Comics, and often featured cloth accessories in addition to plastic items. They fit into most Masters of the Universe vehicles and playsets, and the packages openly informed potential buyers that they could be used for crossplay with the Masters of the Universe toys. The Warlord toy line was another example of a relatively successful and well-made imitator or supplemental toy line, but Remco realized pretty quickly the kids were often looking for cool enemies, and not just heroes to fill out their toy ranks. Thus enter Remco's Warrior Beasts. The Warrior Beasts were yet another Remco toy line that were created to take advantage of the Masters of the Universe toy craze. This product line consisted of demi-human warriors with monster heads, a staple of the sword and sorcery fantasy genre. The line was slightly more extensive than the Warlords, with several head and body variations, but the packaging still touted the action figure's ability to crossplay with other sword and sorcery lines, including their Warlord kin. These figures borrowed heavily from the Warlord product line, and often included the same body molds, weapons, and equipment offered in Remco's other toy line. It was rare for a kid in the 1980s not to have at least one of these sitting in their Masters of the Universe toy case or toy box. In addition to the separately packaged figures on blister cards, Remco threw Warrior Beast figures into window boxes with pre-existing PVC lizard toys. They referred to the lizards as fire dragons, and once again touted how they could be used to play with other sword and sorcery toy lines. But Remco had one more product line to unveil. In 1984, Remco got the license for THE icon of the barbarian fantasy genre. Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian himself. Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentation of their women. The Conan action figure appears to have drawn closer inspiration from the cinematic interpretation than the original black-maned Marvel Comics version. For some reason, he wore a lion's pelt, much like the mythological Heracles, even though he did not wear one in any film. The line consisted of five figures that included Conan's sorceress enemy, Tothamon, a warrior that was clearly inspired by Tulsa Doom's warriors in the Conan the Barbarian film, a repainted warrior beast, and an alternative Conan that depicted him as the King of Aquilonia, but the line came out late in the life of the sword and sorcery toy genre, and it was not considered a success. Well, not all imitator toys are created equal, and this toy line was an example of imitators with far, let's say, inferior standards. This rogues gallery of a toy line went by many names and was produced by many different manufacturers. Galaxy Warriors, Galaxy Fighters, Galaxy Heroes, Swords and Sorcerers, the list of names goes on, but they all refer to one particularly nefarious group of fantasy toys, with a cast of particularly dastardly characters. These little nightmares often showed up as Christmas or birthday gifts from frugal or uninvolved grandparents or aunts who felt they were just as good as Masters of the Universe. This action figure line has developed a bit of a cult following in the past few years, and it is possible to find videos where individuals lose much of their lives in a vain attempt to collect them all and understand their convoluted production history. But as bad as these guys were, they were not the worst. Behold the Fantasy World action figure line and tremble. Consider yourself lucky if one of these never found its way into your Christmas stocking or pile of birthday presents. Created by the toy company known to mortals as Soma, the toy line consisted of eight characters and a non-articulated panther to ride, 
They were not usually found at reputable toy or department stores, but in places you might find yourself on a trip or a family vacation. And now we should move on quickly. The sword and sorcery toy craze of the early 80s did not only spawn imitator toy lines, but whole product lines that had no other function but to support and supplement the Masters of the Universe and other fantasy toy lines. This was the role of dragons, knights, and daggers. The Dragons, Knights, and Daggers product line was produced by the Imperial Toy Company who was known for, among other things, its low quality PVC monster, dinosaur, and animal toys, usually offered in large group display boxes and toy and dime stores in the 1970s and 80s. This line mostly consisted of various fantastic beasts with saddles and other accessories for use with other sword and sorcery toys. They were offered either in display window boxes, which were usually accompanied by a variety of weapons for use with similarly sized fantasy action figures, or loose with nothing but a saddle and a tied-on cardboard tag for identification and description. Some of the more deluxe versions had chariot accessories in which other fantasy toy line characters could ride. The package often imitated the same dark fantasy look of the Masters of the Universe vehicle and playset boxes, who were in turn imitating the style of older fantasy artists. And in a particularly brilliant move, the Dragons, Knights, and Daggers toy line offered sets of extra weapons and armor for use with the Masters of the Universe and other swords and sorcery toy lines of the time. Kids notoriously lost weapons and accessories for their action figures, and this was a great way to keep your figures armed and armored. In addition to the mounts, Imperial continued to offer non-articulated PVC monsters for play with various fantasy lines who were still sold in group display boxes like their earlier dinosaur offerings. These dragons were strange looking and more than a little goofy, but it still gave other sword and sorcery toy lines some much needed giant monster foes to combat in their respective fantasy worlds. <laughs> While the Dragons and Daggers monster toy line could be played with any fantasy toy line, they appeared at the same time as another great series of products, and that couldn't have been just a coincidence. Behold, the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons action figure and product line, one of the greatest toy lines of the early 1980s. These action figures, based on the Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game, were produced on a base 4-inch scale and also included large articulated monsters and toy mounts. The full product line actually included several tie-in toy lines, including an entire supplemental line of in-scale PVC and bendy monsters. I have already created an entire video dedicated to this toy line alone, and it was one of the most extensive and best of its time. The toy line also included several larger 6-inch figure characters. One of the most popular of these was the barbarian hero named Northlord, who also drew heavy inspiration from the barbarian hero zeitgeist of the time. But probably one of the most popular toys in the whole line was another barbaric warrior, the evil fighter named Warduke. This character's chaotic piecemeal armor and helmet that revealed only two glowing red eyes was a perfect example of the early 80s rock and roll fantasy art aesthetic. His look borrowed heavily from another favorite character featured in Frazetta's art, the Death Dealer. The Death Dealer was so 80s rock that to simply look at him was to have a metal guitar riff beam directly into your feeble mind. <laughs> Kids wanted him, and other action figure villains wanted to be him. The Other World was a strange toy line by Arco that was created to take advantage of the sword and sorcery craze of the time, but it was very different from all the others. The action figures were built on a base 4-inch scale, but they were not traditionally articulated. The figures were rubber around a bendable wire frame, much like Mattel's much older Matt Mason sci-fi toy line of the 1960s. Nonetheless, they came with great glow-in-the-dark weapons and accessories and held true to that savage fantasy aesthetic that was so popular at the time. The product line includes many interesting monsters and vehicles, and some kids picked them up just to play with other toy lines. <laughs> 
The Arco Otherworld toy line is a fascinating bit of lost 1980s toy nostalgia that probably deserves a video of its own, if nothing more than for the imagination found behind it. Another strange but aesthetically true to the Times toy line is Dimensions for Children's Dragon Riders of the Sticks. This was a somewhat popular sword and sorcery toy line from that era. The figures were created on a base 3.5 inch scale and while they were pretty poorly made, they seemed to fulfill a niche at the time. It is not unusual to hear someone who was a kid at the time say that they owned at least one of these figures, and the size made them usable for crossplay with smaller scale toy lines such as Star Wars or Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, we were once again given beast headed demi humans, but this time on a smaller scale. The line also offered several vehicle mount products that looked far more like the cars from amusement park haunted attractions. Dragon Riders of the Sticks also offered a fantasy toy playset complete with tiny plastic knights, monsters, and dragons. And that brings us to another staple fantasy toy of the early 1980s, the Sword and Sorcery Toy Playset. These playsets were incredibly common in the 80s. Dimensions for Children made at least six of them during this time, but there are several other manufacturers creating their own variations too. They varied mostly by the playmat and cardboard features and accessories offered, but they were all very similar. The playset is an extensive subgenre of fantasy toys, and they often offered the same basic figurines with each set, and even those that were not created by Dimensions for Children could often be used for crossplay with other manufacturers' lines. The figures were cheap and were made in the same vein as the little green army men toys that nearly everyone had. One of the most blatant rip-offs of the Masters of the Universe aesthetic was this Warriors of the Galaxy playset, which featured muscle warriors locked in combat with humanoid beasts, all armed with laser cannons, high-tech vehicles, and medieval weapons. Being slightly more deluxe than the playsets offered for Dimensions for Children, the figurines had interchangeable weapons and shields. The playset came with a compulsory play mat, but also offered plastic hills or mesas, sci-fi vehicles, and a not quite Castle Grayskull, but in miniature. Fleetwood offered an offshoot of the large box sword and sorcery playsets called the Sword and the Sorcerer. The line took its name from a barbaric fantasy movie released at the time, but the products bore very little resemblance to any creatures or characters that are found in the film. The figurines were only slightly painted and had interchangeable weapons, but were not articulated and were far closer to the figures offered in the playset type toys. They did have some pretty interesting and strange monsters, and I think I would have loved them as a kid, but they looked pretty bad, and they felt like a small prize you might win at a local carnival or a Chuck E. Cheese back in the day. And speaking of small fantasy figures, the 1980s also offered another rather large subgenre of toy, the molded rubber eraser. These were perfect for sneaking into school under the guise of a tool, and even Masters of the Universe offered official smugglable toy erasers. This led to other manufacturers such as Dimensions for Children releasing their own Stygian product in eraser form. The erasers came in a wide variety of molds and quality, and some were molded of just one single color, such as these warrior scented erasers shown here. Were they warrior type scented erasers or warrior scented erasers? Now, perhaps it's best if we don't know, but I'm sure Strawberry Shortcake never had the guts to try that product variation out. And speaking of cheap trinkets popular in the 1980s, stickers were all the rage to put in albums or all over your meat trapper keepers. There were a lot of official Masters of the Universe stickers offered at the time, but other toy manufacturers wanted a piece of the action, too. It looks like the same company that produced those warrior-scented erasers produced their own line. Well, at least it looks like it was based off the same artwork. And there were a lot of both stickers and rubdowns produced that were based off the Dungeons & Dragons material, both from the early role-playing game materials and the LJN toy line. And while we're coming to the end of our discussion of early 80s fantasy toy lines, I can't end without quickly discussing one of the coolest and most unique fantasy toy lines of the early 1980s, the Saga of Chris Star. <laughs> 
The Saga of Chris Starr was a fantasy toy line that was once again based off a comic book. In this case, Marvel's comic series of the same name. Only this time, the comic book and the toy line were developed together. The story centered around the main character of Chris Starr, a human prince given crystal form and enhanced power, and his enemy who was given molten lava form. The figures were built on a base 4-inch scale, which was unique at the time since the D&D line would not come out for another year. The good toy characters were created of translucent, brightly colored plastic to give a crystal-like look, while the bad characters tend to be created of a plain orange plastic to try to give a molten lava-like look. There was even one character that was half translucent plastic and half orange plastic. The good characters also tended to have crystal-like weapons and accessories, and all of the characters came with a crystal prism to look through. There are several videos dedicated to this toy line that are available. It was one of the most interesting toy lines available at that time, and one that really seemed to have a unique identity rather than to be ripped off from the other sword and sorcery lines that were available everywhere at the time. As 1985 encroached, the toy aisle was really starting to change. Hasbro's Transformers and all of its knockoffs and imitators and supplemental toy lines were starting to displace the sword and sorcery toy genre. Robots were now becoming all the rage. But while this was the end of an era for fantasy and sword and sorcery toys, it was not the end of the line. At least not yet. The barbarian toy craze was waning but several more fantasy toy lines would rise from the ashes. These lines would sport a very different aesthetic and see mixed results in terms of sales. The real champion would be LJN's Thundercats line, who would become the new champion of the muscle toy warrior genre. Well, at least until a new toy titan appeared on the horizon.